Okay, we're going to talk about oxygenation and ventilation of the COVID-19 patient. This is module three, where we'll actually go over some of the uh, ventilator equipment that you may see um, in your hospital. The products shown uh, are for demonstration purposes only and often are uh, the ones that I'm most familiar with in my practice um, so that I can point out to you. And the AHA does not uh, endorse or recommend any specific manufacturer or products. Um, and uh, in order to show skills clearly, the healthcare provider shows does not always uh, use the recommended uh, personal protective equipment such as gloves, masks, face shields, and those types of things, but we certainly recommend that you do it, particularly in uh, aerosol generating procedures that uh, we're seeing with this COVID-19 patient population. First, I want to kind of go over the uh, the types of ventilators that you may see, um, and it depends on what they actually can do is how they're broken down. So there's a pneumatic uh, a ventilator here on the left-hand side, and this is a, a one that's powered by a gas source. That can be from a tank or uh, a 50 PSI outlet on the wall. It will actually cycle uh, according to uh, the pressure and the pneumatics built within it. These are fairly simple devices and, and those types of things, and uh, uh, but are very simple to use as well and often are used in kind of these uh, disaster situations, but also used on transport as well. The second one is electrical, meaning it uses electricity to drive like a piston or a turbine um, or blower to ventilate. And so this is an LP10, for example, uh, that actually has a piston in it and it actually pushes that piston forward and those types of things, which then gives you inspiration and, and exhalation uh, is done through a valve. And then the one that you most likely will see in most of your intensive cares is the one that actually combines electrical and pneumatic. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It uses electricity to control valves and solenoids and those types of things, but also uses a pressurized gas source to ventilate um, patients as, as well. And so, um, it allows for faster response time. You can have fancy monitoring of what you're doing, um, uh, hooked up to flow sensors and those types of things. I wanna pause a little bit and just talk a little bit about terms that you may hear going on and kind of being thrown all around you. Again, uh, if you're not as familiar with taking care of mechanically ventilated patients, but uh, these are kind of some ideas that uh, we often talk about. And so when it comes to tidal volume, that's you know the volume per breath. Um, we often talk in five to eight mLs per kilo or in mLs per kilo uh, of predicted body weight. And so that's why you'll often see us try to get their height uh, either by measuring them out or you know getting their driver's license and trying to get uh, a height off of it um, because uh, it allows us to calculate that predicted body weight. And then there's a difference between inspired and expired tidal volume, and they usually should be within 50 mLs. And I actually have a little video of that uh, showing you kind of inspired and expired. We often use the exhale tidal volume to make many of our changes uh, as well. When it comes to respiratory rate, there are several different types of respiratory rate, um, meaning that uh, uh, you see a mandatory, which is often a set rate um, of say 10, uh, you have a spontaneous rate, and that's measured of uh, how many times the patient actually took a spontaneous uh, rate with or without assistance from the ventilator. And then often the biggest number on most of the ventilator screens is the total respiratory rate, and that means that it's the mandatory plus the spontaneous. And so often if you see a total respiratory rate or a big kind of respiratory rate that says 20, and you know the mandatory rate is set at 10, you know that the patient is breathing spontaneously 10 times above that rate of 10, if that makes any sense. When it comes to minute ventilation, uh, this is kind of one of the ones that we use to trigger kind of uh, CO2 elimination. So we know that, you know, for example, if the, uh, the ventilation is six mLs or six liters per minute, um, if that number goes up, typically CO2 goes down. If that number goes down, then typically CO2 goes up. Um, and so often when we make ventilator changes to the respiratory rate or the tidal volume, it uh, impacts the minute ventilation. And the kind of normal values that you'll see is anywhere from 70 to 100 mLs per kilogram per minute of predictable body weight. 
And so roughly five to eight liters per minute, depending on the size of the patient. Now, many of these patients have ARDS, and so they're going to have minute ventilations that exceed this, um, that are, you know, 10 uh, liters, 15 liters, those types of things, uh, because they have lots of dead space ventilation and shunting going on. And so uh, inspiratory times is how long the, the ventilator uh, cycles on inspiration. And so you'll see kind of inspiratory times of 0.7 to 1.2. Um, in pediatrics, you tend to see a little bit lower, and then neonatal, you see even lower uh, inspiratory times. When it comes to kind of airway pressures, uh, you'll see several different types here. Um, one is the peak inspiratory pressure, um, and you'll see it abbreviated kind of PIP or a PAW, um, and so those types of things. And the, it's the highest pressure kind of measured in the circuit during inspiration. And typically we want to keep that below 30 uh, as well. And so now plateau pressure now is a little bit different of a pressure. Um, and this is a pressure that's uh, measured at maximum inspiration and zero flow. So we tend to have to do a procedure called an inspiratory pause um, or put in a uh, plateau uh, in, within the breath to get that measurement value. Um, and this actually tells us uh, the uh, respiratory system compliance or lung compliance. And we also often call it static compliance, or we use that number to calculate uh, a static compliance, meaning zero flow. When it comes to uh, another pressure, there's one called uh, PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure. This is the pressure measured at the end of expiratory phase. And so if you kind of know the acronym, in other words, what it stands for, then you can figure out uh, where it's actually, when it's actually measuring the pressure. And then one that's kind of interchangeably with uh, PEEP is continuous positive airway pressure. And so that's the uh, positive airway pressure that is constant throughout inspiration and exhalation. So uh, if someone's spontaneously breathing on CPAP, a lot of times it just gives them a little bit more flow. A lot of times when they take a breath in and create a little bit negative pressure in the circuit, um, but it's always trying to maintain that continuous positive airway pressure of say six centimeters of water pressure. Now, uh, when it comes to FIO2, this is pretty self-explanatory, but it often you know, it's a fraction of inspired oxygen. And we always love for it to be less than 40% oxygen, but often in this patient population with uh, pretty severe ARDS, you will actually see it much higher than that. When it comes to modes of ventilation, uh, there are several different types and even manufacturers have their own types of, uh, of uh, mechanical ventilation. Um, and many times people break it down to primary modes of ventilation and secondary modes of ventilation. And so primarily meaning, you know, that's the mode that uh, is primarily used uh, in assist control mode. And this is where the ventilator delivers a set minimum number of mandatory breaths uh, each minute. Um, and then when the patient spontaneously breathes, uh, they actually get that same set delivered pressure or volume, depending on if you're in assist control volume control or if you're in assist control pressure control. Um, and so the control being the, the, the term here is that now it's controlling the pressure or it's controlling the volume that it's giving. Now, SIMV uh, or synchronous uh, intermittent mandatory ventilation mode, and this is a, a uh, when the ventilator delivers a minimum set of mandatory breaths, they can also be pressure or volume. Um, and then when the patient breathes outside of that set rate, so say it's a set rate of 10 like I was using earlier, and uh, the patient's breathing 10 times over it, now those 10 spontaneous breaths um, can either be supported or not supported. Often they're supported with pressure support. Um, and so so you'll see uh, those types of modes of ventilation. And then there's some secondary modes of ventilation like uh, APRV that you might see in the more severe um, patients with ARDS. Um, and this is really kind of a primarily pressure control mode of ventilation but allows spontaneous breathing, really long inspiratory times and short expiratory times. And so it's a little bit different way of ventilating uh, but is potentially helpful in these, uh, uh, like I said, severe ARDS patients. And then there's pressure regulated volume control. And so this is kind of a mode that, uh, kind of a dual mode of ventilation that actually allows you to 
uh, target a title volume that you want the ventilator um, to, to go after uh, and achieve. And then it uses pressure control ventilation to achieve that breath. And so it basically breath to breath looks at the title volume and says, did I reach that title volume? If I did not reach that title volume, then I'm gonna increase the pressure on the next breath. If I exceeded that title volume, then on the next breath, I'm actually gonna decrease the pressure again to uh, kind of target that title volume and avoid overshooting or under delivering. When it comes to stockpile uh, ventilator resources that you may be exposed to, these are the three primarily modes of ventilation or uh, manufacturers of ventilation uh, that you may see. And one's the uh, Univent uh, 754, um, the LP10, as I mentioned before, and then the LTV 1200. Um, and so uh, the AARC has uh, some additional resources uh, online that you can uh, learn more about watching their, their videos on the stockpiles and how to actually make changes on these ventilators, which uh, you may find very helpful. When it comes to basic functions and setups of, of ventilators, um, the kind of rules of thumb that we often do is that obviously if it needs electricity, we want to plug it into a red outlet if available. Now, if you're in a you know warehouse that's been converted into a hospital, then you're not likely going to have um, these types of uh, uh, functionality. And so, um, so then you're just going to plug it into any outlet that you have available. And then you're going to plug into a gas outlet, uh, whether that's a tank um, or an outlet in the wall um, where you would actually plug it in to help operate the, the ventilator. You're going to attach the ventilator circuit. Um, typically, uh, the blue line um, is inspiration, the clear or white line uh, is, uh, or large bore tubing is exhalation. And many of the ventilators actually have little uh, either arrows that show you which direction the flow is going in um, and, and which area it's coming back from, or it may show you a patient face, for example, for in inhalation um, with an arrow going out uh, for exhalation. And so uh, many of the ventilators, the modern ventilators, they require a pre-use check. This is really, really important uh, for you to do. It does not take very long, but it just ensures that the, the ventilator is ready to go. Um, and so uh, you will always want to do that. Typically when you turn it on, um, it will actually prompt you, do you want to do a pre-use check? And you often will say yes, and then just follow directions. It'll tell you how to hook up the circuit, those types of things. And so it can be a huge help as well as ensure that, hey, this ventilator is ready to go. And then you often, after the pre-use check, want to put in the initial ventilator settings. And many of them can be used from the previous slides that I mentioned of, of kind of starting points uh, that are, are considered safe. When it comes to uh, making adjustments, uh, this is something that's really important because we kind of highlighted it here in red, um, because a lot of times if you don't do all three of these steps, the ventilator will not make a change for you. And so if you're not as familiar with ventilators, um, you may want to practice a little bit, but you wanna basically press or select the parameter that you want to change. So say you wanna change the respiratory rate, you wanna make those adjustments. Um, and so it's either a turn knob um, or sometimes they're touch screens where you actually can uh, press a positive or a negative uh, button that will allow you to adjust it up or down. And then the last but not least is the one that I see that uh, people sometimes forget is you got to confirm that change. Um, so don't just make the change and then expect the ventilator to do what uh, you asked it to do without confirming it. And so, uh, so if you do not confirm it, uh, the ventilator will revert back to the previous settings and you'll say, oh, I thought I changed that, but you really didn't. Additionally, um, you know, the safety of mechanical ventilation is really important as well, um, particularly when you're chemically paralyzing or sedating to apnea um, in many of these patients. And so you want to make sure that you set the alarms um, because not only will they produce, you know, uh, alerts and stuff like that that aren't necessarily needed uh, if you don't properly set them, um, but it also helps protect the patient or draws your attention to a problem. So typical settings are, um, for example, low pressure or disconnect alarm. And many of the manufacturers, they're preset. In other words, they won't, they won't let you 
uh, change this and so uh, so that they can recognize a disconnect and many times it's a it's a low pressure in combination with maybe a delivered tidal volume that it was expecting to to see um, to help determine whether it's a uh, disconnect or not there are other settings uh, like low peep for example and so typically you set that two to four centimeters below the peep um, that you have set so if you're on six of peep for example then you may set it at uh, four um, and so that if it, if, it, if it goes below four consistently, it will alarm and let you know. And typically when that happens, you have a leak somewhere in the circuit, whether it's like in the tracheal tube or a cuff or something like that. Minute ventilation alarms. Uh, these are important. Remember I told you that minute ventilation often equals uh, CO2 elimination. And so uh, if it goes up and uh, then you wanna be aware of that because you might actually be hyperventilating someone and so we tend to set the how alarm, uh, again, not to create nuisance alarms, um, but typically two times the current minute ventilation. So if the minute ventilation is 10, you would set the how alarm at 20, and you would set the low alarm at five, because um, we do half of the current minute ventilation. Respiratory rates, uh, often they default to 30 or 40 breaths per minute, um, and that's typically uh, appropriate and so some people would set 10 or 15 above um, the current respiratory rate. When it comes to peak airway pressure alarms, uh, often we set those at five to 10 above current peak airway pressure. So if the current peak airway pressure was 25, then you would set the alarm at say 35. Um, and so, and then last but not least, is some manufacturers let you set tidal volume. Uh, we often don't set them uh, uh, because it, it can vary breath to breath a lot of times and you don't want to create nuisance alarms. And if you have a consistent tidal volume change, it will actually change your minute ventilation uh, alarm. And so you'll, you'll trigger that alarm. But you want to also follow the guidelines within your institutional kind of policies and procedures when it comes to alarms. But these are some generalities. And so when it comes to uh, kind of uh, filtering of exhaled gases, we have a couple uh, videos for you to look at um, and, uh, and understand. Uh, often these filters, um, for example, will allow you to filter them, but they're not maintenance free, meaning they need to be changed uh, every 24 hours. And if you're given aerosols or those types of things through it, uh, you may have to, have to change them much more 